So I'm looking really forward to tell you about how we can design future wireless networks that can achieve a more uniform performance than in the past. And we will see along the way here that it's distributed MIMO and sequential frontal that is some of the solutions that I am proposing for my research. So what I will talk about in this keynote is first of all, the importance of spectral efficiency as the performance metric, in particular that we want it to be uniform and what that means. And then I will mention distributed or cell-free MIMO, where MIMO stands for multiple input, multiple output, as a potential solution to this. But solutions are not immediately uh, free of problems. There are particular issues with trying to deploy this technology, and that is leading us to a sequential frontal design, which I will explain to you what that is. And in particular, I will mention something called radius stripe, which is one potential way of building it. And if we build a network based on this architecture that I will describe to you, you can also take algorithms and tailor them to this particular frontal. And that is what I will also talk about some recent research towards the end. And here on the right, I'm just showing some of my funding agencies that are funding my activities in this area. So if we go straight into it, you know, wireless communication is all about sending signals between base stations and mobile phones. And some of the basic things to remember here is that, well, when we send a sequence of bits, well, we are mapping them to different waveforms here. So for example, we might chop up the sequence into two bits at a time. We let uh, zero, zero be represented by this red wave, one zero by the blue wave, one one by the purple wave, and zero one by the green wave. And then when one one is transmitted again, we'll we use the purple one again, and so on. So this is all the, the basic of mapping information to radio waves. And of course, the radio waves doesn't have a color. And they also doesn't look this nice when they are reaching the mobile phone. But we are more expecting to see something that looks like this. Same kind of shape, but there is noise interference added on top of it, and it's attenuated immensely between the transmitter and the receiver. So then what is the goal of communication engineering? Well, to design algorithms that looks at the signal, takes samples of it, and then can compute what was the original sequence of zeros and ones that was transmitted. And why am I saying these type of things? Well, there are a few things that are really important here. One of them is how much time does it take to send one of these symbols, as I call them, one of these waveforms. Well, that is inversely proportional to the bandwidth. So the more spectrum they have, the shorter the time becomes for each of these segments, and the more such segments we can squeeze in per time unit. And here I was exemplifying that we send two bits in each symbol interval. But should we have two, should we have one, or three, or whatever should we have? Well, that depends on the signal strength. And what really matters is not how many bits we are sending, but how many bits we can actually reliably receive. And that is where the channel capacity is an important metric. So it is saying that the number of bits per second that we can transmit is equal to the bandwidth times log two of one plus the signal power at the receiver divided with the interference plus noise power at the receiver. And now, the bandwidth is the number of the symbol intervals that we have per second, and the rest of it here is what I call the spectral efficiency. We can measure it in bits per second per hertz. And this is saying how many zeros and one we should squeeze in in each of these segments. And if it's not an integer number, well, then we are sending slightly more bits, but we are using coding in order to bring down the actual information content to map with what is predicted here. All right, so when are we using this kind of technologies? Well, a lot in cellular networks or mobile networks. And this was a technology that was uh, perceived already in the 1950s. So people were thinking then, for example, at Bell Systems, that, oh, we would like to turn mobile or our phone systems, which were fixed at the time, into mobile telephony systems. And how should we do that? Well, we have the limited number of frequencies that we can use uh, to let people talk to each other. So we need to divide them between customers and divide them between different areas. 
So they came up with this idea already in the 50s and 60s that we should divide the world into areas that they call cells, put an access point, AP, in each of these areas, and then let the uses within each area be served by that access point. And when someone in one cell would like to talk to someone in another cell, well, then the access point is facilitating that communication through a wired backhaul or a wireless backhaul between these different access points and potentially to the core networks. So this was the technology that people were coming up with already in the 1950s. And then we have continued using these things, and particularly in the 80s, the first generation of mobile telephony was showing up, then the second in the 90s, and so on. And it's really based on this kind of thing that we have a limited amount of frequency spectrum, we need to reuse it in space over different regions. And how can we do that? Well, we let access points have some different sets of the frequencies, and we are then putting out more access points when we have more users, so that the number of customers for each access point is limited, and we can control interference by telling which access point you use the same frequencies at the same time. So that is the, the underlying principle. And 5G is still a cellular technology, even if we were, from the beginning, designing this for making phone calls. And now we are mainly using our telephones to send data. So when we are sending data, it is the spectral efficiency that is the important thing, because the bandwidth times the spectral efficiency is telling you what data speed you're getting. And when you make a phone call, for example, well, you just need a small amount of spectral efficiency in order for it to work out well. And beyond that one, well, you don't get more happy, you don't get a better uh, quality when the spectral efficiency goes beyond a certain number. But for data transmission, the story is different. And this is what I will illustrate here by considering two ways we can build networks of today. One option is to have four cells in a particular region and each of them have a big tower with a lot of antennas. For example, 100 antennas. This is known as massive MIMO. Multiple input, multiple output, and the inputs are then all of the antennas at the base station. The outputs are the users that can be served at the same time, or potentially the antennas in the same device. An alternative would be to take these 4 times 100, so 400 antennas, and spread them out over the same area instead. So we have 400 cells, but only one antenna at the access point. And this is called small cells. And I'm illustrating here not exactly 400 cells, but that you get the, the, the point. We spread them out over the same region. And if we would now do some calculations here, and figuring out what spectral efficiency will I get as a user when I'm moving around in this region. Well, if we are in the massive MIMA with big cells, we get the black curve here, and when you have small cells, we get the red curve. So what am I showing here? Well, the spectral efficiency on the horizontal axis, from 0 up to 10 or 12 bits per second in hertz, and then there is a CDF, a cumulative distribution function, which tells you that when I'm moving around here in a random fashion, I will see big and small values. There will be a random distribution of what strength I'm getting, and that is represented like this. So what you can see is that sometimes there is a probability of getting a low number, sometimes I get a high number, sometimes I get something in between. But the point here is that these two curves look very much the same. So as a user, you might not really see the difference, whether your operators put up big cells with advanced technology or small cells with not so advanced technology, only one antenna time. And the reasons for this is, however, very different. If you are in these big cells, if you're close to your base station, you're up here and you get a strong signal. And when you are at the edges between the cells, you have a weak signal because you're far away from your base station. In the small cells, you are never far away from your base station. You can be close and get a strong signal, but when you are at the edges between cells, you will have strong signals to multiple access points, and they will interfere with each other. And so that is the reason for getting low performance part of the time. So the main thing here is that you have large variations from the largest numbers to the smallest numbers. So if we then think about what data rates, data speeds do we need to use today and in future networks? Well, there are a number of different things you could 
would like to use your mobile phone or laptop or whatever for. A popular data intensive thing is to send data uh, for videos. Uh, and maybe for a full HD video, you need five to 10 megabit per second. For 4K or full, uh, what you call, uh, ultra high definition video, you might need 20 to 25 megabit per second. Online gaming, not so much. Uh, this is per device. If you have multiple people at the same time, of course, you need to multiply this with a number of users. Even if you look into the future for rather uh, extreme use cases, maybe people will walk around with virtual or augmented reality glasses. They need 8K resolution. They need to have an immersive 360 degree view. And maybe then you will need 10 times more data per second as before. But my point here is that if you look at 4G, the previous generation, it had the top speed of one gigabit per second in low mobility, 100 megabit per second in low high mobility scenarios where it's more complicated to deliver this performance. So we could already deliver most of these things with 4G. And with 5G, we are multiplying these top peak values with 20 times. So then we are even further beyond what most of the use cases that you will need in the future is requiring. So what is the problem here? Why are we still building new networks and trying to improve the networks? Well, the real challenge is not to get high peak rates on a piece of paper, but to get consistent performance because the spectral efficiency is varying so much between when you are at a good place and a bad place. And of course, you as a customer can never know if you are at the bad place or not. So we need to design the networks to deal with this, to get rid of the bad cases and get more consistent performance. So what is the potential solution to this? Well, remember, we had these two cases, big cells or small cells, and both cases we get the same performance. So the problem was with the small cells that when you are at the edge between multiple cells, you get strong signals from multiple places and they are interfering with each other. But what if we could deal with that interference by letting all of these access points that actually have a good signal quality to you serve you? Well, if everything is collaborating here in this region, you have like more one big cell with distributed antennas, a distributed MIME system. And in that case, you could actually get what we call cell-free massive MIME or distributed MIME, which is this blue curve here. We take the worst cases and we push them up by maybe four times. So all of a sudden you never have a bad signal quality. There is still some variations depending on if you're close or far away from your access point, but you're never really far away so that you get a bad signal from all the access points. So this is a distributed MIMO system. This is what my textbook Foundation of User-Centric Cell-Free Master MIMO is describing the basic theory from. And I'll provide you with some of the basic insights about why this is a good way of designing the systems for the future. So first of all, this is a bit of a paradigm shift in how we are viewing the networks. So classically, we are building these high tall towers with a lot of antennas and they are surrounded by users at different distances. And we would like to turn this around so that all of a sudden you as a user are instead surrounded by many small access points. There will be differences in how far away you are from them, but you're always close to some of them. And in the 5G literature, massive MIMO is used for scenarios where you have many more antennas at the base station than you have users. So in 5G, you might have a scenario with 64 or 100 antennas at the base station and you're serving 4, 8, 16 use at the same time. So you see that there are 64 versus 16, there is a four or maybe eight times difference between the number of antennas at the base station and uh, the number of users that you're serving in your cell at the same time. And um, we are borrowing this when we are talking about cell-free networks, that there should be many more access points around you than there are users. So you're always in a situation where you are feeling that you're surrounded by small access points. How can you build something like this? Well, you need to make sure that all of these access points can collaborate. They need to have a infrastructure for doing that. And this is something called Cloud RAN, Radio Access Network. So you're connecting all of the access points together through 
front hall cables to some kind of central processing unit or an edge cloud. And then you have your access point. So all of these um, uh, access points are sending signals back and forth through this so-called front hall to the uh, central processing unit that is collaborating or enabling the collaboration between the different access points. And remember, we call it frontal now, not backhaul. Backhaul is between an access point and the rest of the world, while here the frontal is just a connection between the processing unit and the antennas. And one of the unique operating regimes that makes such a network different from what people have been considering in the past is really this thing that you have a lot of access points, but each access point have very simple hardware. So they might have more users around them, or at least the same number at this, they have antennas. So on their own, they are not able to deal with interference and everything, but when they're collaborating, they can get a great performance for the users. So I will go through the uplink and downlink philosophy of how they are dealing with interference so you get a better sense of that. So in the uplink, we can start with the cellular networks. We have three users transmitting to their access points here. And uh, each one of them have a desired location that is a solid line showing where they want the signal to be transmitted. And each of the receivers here, which are the access points, they are getting a mix of their desired signal from their own user and the interfering signals from the other users. So they observe one signal because they have one antenna and that signal is a mix of one desired signal and two interfering ones. So there isn't really any good way of separating this. If you think of it as a linear system of equations, you have one observation but three unknowns, it's fundamentally hard to try to get anything out of this. So the only way of trying to deal with the interference is to let the users take turns in transmitting, which is inefficient, or let them interfere, which is also inefficient. So there's too few observations to remove the interference. In a cell-free network, we are instead letting these three access points connect together and do joint signal decoding. So they are sharing their received signals with help from the central processing unit. And all of a sudden, they have three observations, there are three user signals that they would like to uh, decode. And now in the absence of noise, you have three equations with three unknowns, and therefore you are able to distinguish all of the signals. In reality, there will be noise at the signals, so there is still some ambiguity about how to find the signals. So what you typically do is that you do a noise signal decoding. You try to figure out what signal is closest to our estimate of the uh, received signal uh, in the absolute value square and um, yeah, expectation, so the mean squared error. And we try to minimize this by finding the signal. So this is a classical way of, of finding the optimal, uh, yeah, most likely transmitted signals. And I will not go into more mathematical detail on this, just leave it at that. The mean squared error is often a very important metric to consider when you are designing the receiver. Okay, so if you turned around and now we are transmitting from the access point to the users, why would you ever like to transmit from more than one access point? Uh, so consider this scenario, you have access point one, access point two, both of them have the same gain beta to the user. So that is essentially the attenuation. And we assume now that we have a total transmit power P that I can divide between the two access points in whatever way I like. So one option is that I only let access point one transmit. Then my received power will be the transmitted power multiplied with the gain beta. That is the fraction of the transmitted power that gets received. All right. If I am instead transmitting from both of these access points, I will divide the power. So I transmit with power P over two from each access point. And then the signals are not added up in power. They are added up in amplitude. So we now make sure that the two signals from the access point are adding up constructively at the user here, I take the square root of the power, multiply with the square root of the gain, I add it up for both of the two access points, and then I square it. And when I do the math here, it turns out that an extra factor two is showing up here. And this is thanks to coherent combination of signals over there. So when these two access points are transmitting, 
together, their signals are adding up constructively on top of each other, and that is essentially doubling the power that is received. There is no magical creation of power here. It's just that there are other directions, other locations where there's less power, but they are jointly focusing the signal power at the user. And how do you figure out how to allocate the power? Well, if both of the access points have the same strength, then it's easy, you split the power. If one of the access points have a stronger signal to the user than the others, you still benefit from transmitting from both the access points, thanks to this coherent combination. But you should allocate the power between the access points to minimize the mean squared error, once again. So what this really means physically is that we are concentrating power at the user side. And conventionally, we are placing this kind of base station at rooftops or in towers, and they are a big array that is focusing signal energy towards the user. This is what we call beam forming. Send a focus signal beam towards the desired user, and you can steer around the direction of it depending on where the user is. This is what 5G is capable of doing very well. But what we are instead doing here is more like what I'm showing here. This is a extreme case. I have a room which is five wavelengths times five wavelengths large, and every star here along the wall is one access point. So they are a, a quarter wavelength apart. And then all of them are transmitting power, focus on one particular location here. And what I'm showing here is the normalized channel gain, so value between one and downwards. And they're all phase shifting their signal, so it's going to end add up constructively at this location. So that is where I get the maximum value. And then there is a small region around where the user is where they also get the strong signal, but elsewhere they are very weak. So we are essentially creating this ball of strong signal energy around the receiver. And this is unique to the case when you're transmitting to the user from many locations. That is when you don't get the focused flashlight uh, flashlight-like transmission towards the user, but instead you get this focused ball of energy around the user. And the diameter of this ball can be down to wavelength divided by two if you have really dense situations here with a lot of access points. Some people might be familiar with the concept of having base stations collaborating and have seen this in the past. There is the concept in 4G called coordinated multipoint. But the idea was also to start with a cellular network. So you see you have access point, you have users, I've drawn cell boundaries between them. So there are one user in each of the cells here and some of them are empty. And what 4G coordinated multipoint was about was the idea that let's create clusters of base stations. So look at them now. Three access points are creating a cluster with the same color. And these three access points are serving together all of the users within their cluster. So for example, the red cluster here have two users. And this is a so-called network-centric design in the sense that we are predefining these access points, these three access points, how the infrastructure possible to collaborate. So they can collaborate, but not with any other access points. And this certainly helps interference mitigation. For example, this green user here is in between two access points and all of those ones are belong to the same cluster. But this red user here is close to access point belonging to different clusters, and it will certainly be getting interference there still. So this isn't really a solution to the entire problem, only to some of the issues. What we are considering now with cell-free or distributed MIME is the idea that every user should instead pinpoint which are the closest access points that have a strong signal to me, and then they should select the cluster of access points around them that they would like to be served by. So we see there is the yellow cluster here, the red cluster, blue cluster, and so on, and you see that they are surrounding the user. This is a user-centric design, the users are selecting, and they are also overlapping, which is requiring this kind of flexible cloud infrastructure to do the computations, to enable this kind of collaboration that was not possible in the past. So how can we implement something like this in reality? Well, there are different kinds of signal processing that needs to be done in order to enable the communication. So the first thing is channel estimation. So the access point, both in the uplink and the downlink, need to figure out what is the channel coefficients to my different users right now, so I can adapt my transmission, send signal energy there, making sure that different access points add up their signals constructively and so on. 
So this needs to be done somewhere. Pre-coding, which is how you are selecting the transmission and downlink to making sure that the signal add up constructively, that needs to be done. Combining the reverse thing in the uplink so that access point can process their signals and uh, yeah, collaborate, add up their signal constructively. Data encoding needs to be done somewhere. This bit stream needs to be turned into a signal that can be sent over there. And decoding, well, the received signal needs to be decoded somewhere. And you see there are multiple levels here. There's the access points, there's the central processing units, and in a big network, there will for sure be multiple uh, central processing units. So sometimes a user is only served by access point belonging to one cluster, one CPU, and some users are served by access point belonging to multiple CPUs. So then also those CPUs need to talk to each other. One centralized way of implementing this would be to do all the processing at this level here with the central processing units. So the access point are just receiving signals uplink immediately forward them to the CPU level where you do all the computations. And then you are decoding the data and do the combining and channel estimation, everything. And then you are telling the access point, this is what you're gonna transmit, send it down here. And the access point is just transmitting whatever they are told to transmit. A distributed version is to let the access point do as much as possible. CPUs are doing what is really necessary, like encoding data and decoding data in the uplink. But all of the pre-processing and post-processing is done at the access point, because of course, today you can put a lot of processing power at the access point. So in the beginning of this cell-free mass in Mimera, which started around year 2015, then people were believing that distributed version is the optimal way of doing things because you need to uh, do, make use of a lot of signal processing capabilities at the access point and you're reducing the amount of signaling that are sent up to this CPU level. And that makes a lot of sense. If you're processing things here, of course, there should be less signals to send up the CPUs, but it turns out to actually not be true. And this is something that we showed in a paper called Making Cell-Free Master MIMO Competitive with MMSE Processing and Centralized Implementation, which is a paper that we received the IEEE Marconi Prize Paper Award for. And the surprising thing is that we actually need less signaling if we do all the processing at the CPU level. And why is that? Well, that is because an access point is typically having the same or fewer number of antennas as there are users around them that they want to serve. So if you have one antenna but serve two users, then if you are pre-processing your received signal in the uplink, you need to split your one-dimensional data into two-dimensional data, one for each user, and therefore you're doubling the amount of information need to be sent up to the CPU compared to just sending everything up there and do the processing there. And of course, if you are sending things to a central processing unit that have access to everything, you can also do a much more advanced processing. So both in terms of signaling and performance, you actually would like to do the centralized version of everything. So that is what I will focus on in the remainder of this talk. There are definitely practical issues that need to be overcome. And one is that we don't want to create a spaghetti monster. So what does this really mean? Well, uh, the meatballs here are essentially these central processing units and the noodles are the frontal that are connected to access point at the end here. And if every access point had their own dedicated cable here and you have 100 access points connected to the same central processing unit, you will have a lot of cables. It will be a mess and that is the spaghetti monster. So another way of looking at it here, you see there's all of these cables that are going from the access points into the central processing units. And deploying this reality in the city, it will be a nightmare because you will need a lot of cables everywhere and dig up uh, the streets and whatever you need to do. But there is an alternative, namely to use a sequential frontal instead of a dedicated one. So here the idea is that you have an access point that is far away from your central processing unit, and when you dig the cable to the uh, CPU here, you are actually putting additional access point along the way. And in that way, you need much fewer cables. And you could potentially do this everywhere, connecting these three access points in a sequence here. And this is something that we came up with when I was working at Linköping University together with Ericsson. And 
we were telling them here are all the great benefits of trying to build a distributed MIME system. And they would say, well, yeah, the benefits are there, but it's very hard to actually implement this. And then we came up jointly with this idea that they call radio stripes. So the idea is that you have your central processing unit, you have your cable here, and in this cable, you have some antenna units here, which contains the radio that is taking a digital signal and turned into analog one, and then the antennas need to stick out. Or if you are at high frequencies, uh, so beyond 10 gigahertz or so, you might actually be able to fit the antennas into something that have the same size of the cable. And this was something that Ericsson was showing in at the Mobile World Congress in 2019. So why would this kind of concept be useful? Well, there are many different reasons. One of them is that there are cultural places. For example, this is the Fontana di Trevi in Rome. And these are places where you're not allowed to put up base stations. There is a lot of people there who want to see this cultural place, but base stations are too ugly to deploy there. However, if you look closely here at the image, you see there is surveillance cameras here, for example, and that they have hidden into this lamppost and of course, you can put out some kind of radio stripe of the kind I'm having here with a frontal cable processing unit and antenna sticking out of it. If you put it here, no one will notice. If you put it along the side of the building, no one will notice. And there are other places where you take a compact classical base station and you drag it out, you spread it out in such a way that it becomes invisible. In the factory, where you would like to replace cables with wireless connectivity, you would need an immense reliability to do that. But if you put this radio strike with a lot of antennas everywhere in the ceilings, you will have so much you call macro diversity. So uh, many different uh, access points that can serve you that you always have a strong signal to some of them. And if you are thinking about something like the World Cup in football, uh, you have a stadium with a lot of uh, people and all of them would like to have wireless connectivity at the same time. The classical base station will not be able to deal with that because if you put it far away, uh, well, a lot of users will fall into the same beam. But if you are instead deploying a lot of these radio stripes, which are nearby the users, they will all get different mixes of the signals and they can deal with interference with smart signal processing. So a little bit more details. What could go into a cable like this? Well, the idea would then be that you have some kind of uh, yeah, protective material. Inside of the cable, you have the frontal uh, and power uh, connector. So the idea would, for example, be that you are having some power of Ethernet, the power of fiber technology, so you can build this on existing standards, where you can already build things that are 100 meters long and deliver both power and data connectivity over such a cable. And within the cable, you have this APU antenna processing units that are doing some of the signal processing. So there is a digital signal processing unit, there is AD and D A converters, mixers, and uh, oscillators and amplifiers and antennas sticking out here. And in order to make sure that all of the small local oscillators here are synchronized, well, you send clock signals over your uh, radio stripe as well. So, the main thing here is there is a sequential front hole and you have antennas along the cable. You can spread them out and having the antennas close by or tens of meters away from each other. And instead of having very high quality hardware as in the classical base stations, when you are spreading them out and you're close to uses, you might be able to build with, with cell phone grade components and potentially printed electronics, for example. But this is not solving everything. It might be convenient or more convenient at least to deploy it, but there are issues with this kind of uh, serial frontal. So one of them is that the capacity requirement accumulates. And I will demonstrate this here. I have a user sending a signal S and I have three access points that are receiving it. So the first access point makes an observation, Y1, of the signal, and it passes it on to the second one. The second access point is simultaneously observing Y2, its observation of S, and now it needs to pass on Y1 and Y2 to the next access point, which also have their own observation, Y3, and now it needs to pass on Y1, Y2, Y3. So you see that the capacity of these cables are 
increasing proportional to how many access points you have inside the cable. At least the last segment of the cable need to have that kind of capacity. And this is problematic because, yeah, you need to put up fewer cables, but the cables need to be thicker in some sense or uh, having a higher capacity so they become more expensive still. But can we design the signal processing to circumvent this so that the same capacity requirement is required everywhere? And yes, we can. And that is what I will show you, finally, some recent results around that. So let's start with the uplink. And let me first make an analogy to something called the Kalman filtering or the Kalman approach, which is this kind of thing where there is a signal S that you would like to estimate. And a priori, you have a certain guess, S0 hat. This is my initial guess, maybe just zero. And I have a covariance, which is my variance of my guess, the initial thing. At time one, I make an observation, y1. And then the Kalman filter is providing me with a mechanism of taking my prior and my observation and compute a new estimate, s1 hat. This is my new estimate. I have a new covariance, c1, which is then an updated, hopefully smaller variance than before. Next, at time two, I make a new observation. I take my previous estimate, I take my new observation, I put them together according to what the Kalman filter is telling me. I get a new, better estimate, hopefully a smaller variance. And then it goes on like that. At time three, I get a new observation. I combine with the previous estimate to get a new estimate uh, that should be better with the smaller variance. And you can, in general, build this kind of things for the scenario where S is evolving with time as you try to track it. Here, S is the same. So I just have a better and better estimate. And instead of collecting all of my observations at one point and then compute an estimate, I'm computing an estimate and then refine it sequentially. This is called sequential linear minimum mean square error estimator. And it provides exactly the same performance as if I would just collect all the observations and then make the computations. So how is this related to what I was describing with the sequential frontal? Well, it says time here, but this could just as well just be a different access point at the same time. So I have my first access point here. It is observing a signal Y1. It computes an estimate S1 hat, and it passes on its estimate and the uncertainty that it had with the estimate to the second access point, which have observed Y2. And it takes this input and provides a new estimate, new covariance, pass it on to the next access point. Uh, which is then computed a new estimate that is improved. So what you see here, the frontal capacity is not increasing with how many access points I'm having because I'm sending a new improved version all the time along the front hall. One can say, well, isn't there some delay here? You can't pass on the signal from one access point to the next one until you have received from the previous access point and then you have done some computations. And that is true. Uh, there will be some extra delay if you do this kind of sequential processing here along the radio stripe. Uh, the problem will not be so big if you're sending a large amount of data. So if you, you have a block of 10,000 data symbols and then you have a delay of two symbols, then that is a very negligible thing. Can we do something similar in the downlink when we have free access point that would like to serve users? Yes, but it requires a bit more uh, advanced techniques, something called team decision approach. So the idea is the following. I have free access point to have their own so-called local channel state information, CSI. So it knows something about the channels from the users to itself. Uh, and then we have data that has been encoded for both of the users. They are sent from the CPU to access point one. And now this access point need to make a decision without asking the other ones, because this information flow is only going in one direction here. So it decides on, okay, I would like to transmit towards the users with this directivities and with these powers. Then it passes something on to the next access point. It passes on the data and something that represents the signals. It's not the actual channel state information, it's a representation of how strong will the signal be that I'm creating towards both of the users and how much interference are they creating towards each other. At this access point, I am now taking this input, I take my own channel state information and I'm deciding how to transmit. So it transmits in a different way and now it performs a computation that we call team minimal mean squared error or team MMSE. 
So once again, it's the MSC criterion that shows up as a good design criterion. So it figures out, okay, I should send these beams in these directions uh, in order to complement what the first exit point we're doing. So we are operating well as a team. And then I'm passing on the data and a mix of the channel state information from the two access points. And what mix is that? Well, what is the joint strength of the signal that I'm generating to the blue user and to the yellow user? And what is interference that I'm causing between them? This is the information you pass on, not the individual inputs of the two, user, uh, two access points. And finally, this last access point takes this input and make a decision in this case that it's not worth for me to transmit to the yellow users because I would create so much interference to the blue one. So it's better that I just transmit a little bit to the blue one and direct my beam a bit so that we are not interfering too much with the yellow one. All right, so how does this work in practice? Here is a simulation example of that. So we are considering seven users in a region and we have a radius stripe around them. So to circle the region here. Every access point here have two antennas and there are 30 of them. And I'm showing here spectral efficiency, once again, and a cumulative distribution function. So there is a random location of the receiving users inside of this area. And here are the variations in performance that they are experiencing. If I do a centralized implementation, I get the green performance, largest numbers, mostly to the, the right. If I am ignoring the fact that there are other access points, uh, every access point is on their own, I get the blue performance and there is a large reduction here. So this is what a distributed implementation of self remaster MIMO would do. And with this proposed team MMSE approach, we get these orange curves here, which is much closer to the centralized one, but requires much less signaling as well. So in summary, what do we get if we are mixing the physical layer from Massive MIMO with an ultra dense network. So we deploy access point densely, many more access point users. And then we let those access point operate uh, jointly to do joint transmission to the users following the way that we will do with Massive MIMO, but in a distributed fashion. Well, that is the cell free Massive MIMO or distributed MIMO scenario. What is the main goal? Well, to reduce the data rate variations between the users in the network. Uh, essentially by surrounding the user by antennas, you're always close to some of them and therefore you are not getting large variations in performance. We need to avoid too much cabling so that we can connect all these access points to central processing units without having a lot of cables. And that is where the radio stripe with sequential front tools are very promising as a solution. But it creates the problem that we uh, also need a capacity that is increasing unless we are uh, yeah, creating sequential processing protocols that are limiting the frontal signaling, making it proportional not to number of access points, but only to number of users that we are serving in this stripe. And we can utilize distributed computations to replace computations at the CPU. It's optimal in the uplink to do this. In the downlink, it's not optimal because you need to make decisions in the sequence and maybe the last uh, access point in the stripe would like to revise what the first one was doing. We can't do that, but we are still getting much better performance than in a fully distributed scenario. So to wrap up, if you all would like to learn more about the technical details here, here are some of the key references in this area. So self remaster MIMO was one of the first papers on the topic here, and one of the first overview papers that I was a co-author of. Here are some of the papers that are containing the technical details I've described, and if you would like to dive into the details, you can find the simulation code on my GitHub so you can test uh, these things yourself. I would like to thank you for listening. I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, many of them that I mentioned on this page here. And yes, I have a podcast and a YouTube channel where you can learn much more about this topic and dive deeper into uh, self-free massive IMO and other types of future wireless technologies.